unlike ReZero, Danmachi is a show that takes quite a few liberties with the way that it adapts the novels. There are often quite a few scenes that get left out per episode, sometimes even entire subplots, all of which allow us to better understand the world of Orario outside of the Hestia Familia. So this weekly cut content series will go through exactly what the anime didn't include from the novels. Then once I catch up to where the anime is currently at, you can expect these videos to come out every Thursday. Until then, be sure to subscribe so you can get notifications of when I upload them. Now, let's begin. Episode 1, Wine, covering chapters 1 to 2 of volume 9 of the light novel. Before the opening scenes that we see in the anime, there was first a prologue that gave backstory to Wine's earliest memories. We find out that she was born in an area of the dungeon that not a single adventurer had ever set foot in, but not born in a way that you or I typically understand. Wine's birth was more of an awakening. Her existence was one that came from the very walls of the dungeon. Her earliest memory was the action of breaking from the wall and falling to the floor. It was after this that her instincts led her to wander around the dungeon in search for her own kind. But everything she encountered seemed to reject her. When Wine tried to ask the other creatures where she was, she would only ever be met with violence. It was while running away from these monsters that she just so happened to stumble upon a group of adventurers. When she tried to approach them and ask for help, they too reacted in very much the same way. So for this monster who'd only just been born, she couldn't understand why this was happening. She didn't even know what she was. The only things that she could understand were the feelings of despair, sadness, and pain that now filled her body bringing us to the initial scenes from the anime where she was being chased by the adventurers. This was the end of the prologue. Moving on to chapter 1, three days had passed since the war with Rakia had ended, allowing Bell and the others to resume their activities in the dungeon. As soon as they got to the town on the 18th floor, Bell was asked to assist with the handling of what's called irregulars. This was the term used to refer to an unpredictable outbreak of monsters, and in this case it was an outbreak of firebirds. They were currently swarming in hordes throughout the 19th floor's colossal tree labyrinth, which for obvious reasons posed a threat that no adventurer could simply ignore. So that's why Bell's group was asked to help. In exchange, every person was paid in advance with robes made from burn-resistant salamander wool. Now, because Bell's agility was so high, he was partied up with a different group of adventurers so that he could assist with scouting. But since this was a floor that Bell was completely unfamiliar with, the moment the group started moving at full speed, he immediately got left behind, leaving him alone in some random corner of the labyrinth. That's when he came across Wine. At first he believed this hobbling figure to be an injured adventurer, but the closer he got, the more apparent it became that this wasn't what it was, eventually seeing Wine for the Vuiver that it was. A Vuiver was one of the rarest monsters in the dungeon, typically only ever appearing in the 19th and 24th floors. It was a species of dragon well known for its unmatched physical strength, making it quite valuable for its scale and claw drop items. That said, the most valuable part of the Vuiver was by far the red gem set in its forehead, an item that's typically known as the Vuiver's Tear, but also gained the nickname of the Prosperity Stone for its immense value in the market. The problem though was trying to obtain it. Slaying the monster would only result in the stone shattering and extracting it while the monster was still alive would only make it go berserk. Numerous adventurers had tried to obtain these stones in the past, but many only ended up being shred to pieces by the resulting rage. That made it a very dangerous monster to approach. But something about this one seemed to be different. For starters, it didn't have the typical appearance. I mean, usually Weavers had a snake-like lower body and a dragon's tail, but this one only had thin human-like legs. It made Bell think that perhaps this wasn't a monster at all. The part of him that was taught to never trust a monster was now battling with the part of him that wanted to rescue this girl. So unsure as to what the best action was to take, Bell actually began to just walk away. His initial conclusion was to act like he never saw anything at all, but his back didn't stay turned for long since that was when the Firebird appeared, leading Bell to act in a way that even he himself couldn't understand. He found that he couldn't kill her and he couldn't leave her behind, so that meant he could only take her with him. But first he decided to treat her wounds with a potion. One thing to note about potions is that there's a specific way that you need to apply them in order for them to work properly. 
Simple flesh wounds were actually quite simple, but fixing broken bones needed some initial preparation. If the potion was applied before the bone was placed back into its proper position, then the restorative effects would heal the bone at an improper angle, often causing permanent damage in the process. Because this was something that Bell wanted to avoid, he decided not to attempt to heal Wiene's leg. Instead, he pulled her over his shoulder so he could support her as they tried to find a way back to the others. Remember, Bell was still lost in this labyrinth, so he needed to find a way back to the main path in order to make use of the map that Lily had given him. It was as he did that Bell finally realized that he was letting his guard down with a monster. He still didn't know why he was doing it, but he did wonder if it was perhaps because of her appearance. He thought that maybe this time he went a bit too far when it came to the prospect of saving a damsel in distress. But that was a mindset that slowly began to sway when this dragon girl managed to muster out a thank you, all while presenting Bell with a warm and gentle smile. This was the very moment in which Bell knew that he had to protect this girl. If she could put on a smile that was just like everyone else's, then that was something that Bell felt was worth protecting. After a little wandering around, eventually Bell reached the main route that guided him back to the 18th floor. He left Wiene in a deep part of the forest, then went to find the others and tell them what happened. One thing to note about this whole interaction was that the term monster fetish wasn't just some on-the-spot insult. It was a common term used to describe those who feel an abnormal attraction towards anthropomorphic monsters like harpies or lamias. Not only that, but it was also one of the worst things to be called within Arario. People hated those with a monster fetish almost as much as they hated the monsters themselves. That's just how deeply rooted the hatred between those two species were. Now, unlike in the anime, Lily was actually the last person to lower her guard. Everyone else had already accepted that Wiene wasn't currently a threat. But Lily continued to reject what Belle was proposing. It was only after she looked directly at Wiene and saw a reflection of her former self that she decided to let Belle do what he wanted. It's not like she was happy with the current situation, but she also wasn't going to just sit around and do nothing either. So Lily had everyone wait till nighttime, then discreetly guided them back to the surface. The only people who saw them leave was Fels and Uranos. It was during their ensuing conversation that there was actually a little bit of skipped foreshadowing. Oranos had mentioned that there was no connection between the Hestia Familia and the hunters that they were pursuing, implying that he himself was in search of the Familia responsible for taking monsters captive. Now, before we get to the Hestia mansion, they first showed a couple of the events leading up to it. When they first got to the surface, Wiene was shocked to see how vibrant and alive it was in comparison to the dungeon, so much so that they had to calm her down before going any further. Then, once they reached their home, Lily had to go ahead first in order to dismiss the Miyok Familia from their posts. Remember, because Hestia's mansion was so big, that made it a prime target to be looted while everyone was gone, especially when everyone was in the dungeon. So Hestia would hire either Takuma Kazuchi or Miyok's Familia to keep watch over their home, and this time it just so happened to be Miyok and his new followers of Daphne and Cassandra. Had it been Takuma Kazuchi, then maybe they would have shared their secret. But because Naza didn't have a very fond past with monsters, everyone felt it would just be best to exclude them. After Hestia met Wiene and accepted Belle's decision for what it was, that's when we get to the topic of Wiene's name. Belle's initial suggestion of Willisine was one that came from a story that he had liked ever since he was young. It was a story about a fairy named Melisine who fell in love with the hero who saved her life. In order to get closer to this hero, the fairy then tried to disguise her existence and live among the humans. But one day the hero had discovered her true nature, causing them to go their separate ways. It was only in the end that they finally reunited in order to slay a dragon that was threatening the hero's home. So due to the relevant nature of this story, Belle thought it would be fitting to combine Melisine's name with Vweaver, thus resulting in his suggestion. In any case, it was after this that we got a more in-depth look into how everyone was feeling. For Belle, the entire foundation that supported the preconceived animosity between man and monster had crumbled entirely. For everyone else though, they weren't yet able to come to any sort of conclusion. In fact, they were so unsure about this monster being in their home that when Wiene had fallen asleep on Belle's lap, they didn't allow her to spend the night alone with him. At first, everyone had left to go to their own rooms, leaving Belle with Wiene in the common area. Then, one by one, each person came back and either claimed a spot on the sofa or the floor. It's not like they wanted to have a sleepover or didn't trust Belle to behave well with this girl. It was simply because they didn't trust her. 
Welf was leaned up against the wall with his greatsword on his lap. Mikoto was on the futon next to Haruhime with her short sword in reach. Then, Lily had fallen asleep on the floor with a very firm grip on her bowgun. Each of them except for Belle was prepared for the worst. Belle, on the other hand, was thinking something completely different. To him, he felt that if this girl didn't have that red gemstone in her head, then she could very easily pass for a normal person. It was because of this that all he wanted to know right now was what this girl really was, bringing with it thoughts of a very uncertain future. Now, as we saw, the next day was spent searching for information. The first conversation with Hephaestus can pretty much be summed up to two questions. The first being if she'd ever heard of a monster that could speak, and the second being what she would do if she ever found one. Of course, Hephaestus had never heard of these types of monsters before, but she did become very curious as to what Hestia was talking about. That's when we switch over to Mikoto. She made sure to only consult with deities that she knew to be trustworthy. So that meant only Take and Miyak. That said, she made them promise not to share any information with mortals. No matter how trustworthy they may seem to be, it was just too high risk to allow anyone else to know. Then, the rest of the conversation went on pretty much as we saw. Moving on to Wealth, his search for information was also very similar. But you're probably wondering why he even went to the guild. Well, as someone who's spent a lot of time there before, he knew that important bits of information can be picked up from even the most mundane of conversations. Not to mention that his level up made his sense of hearing a lot better than it already was. So, eavesdropping in the guild seemed like a decent way to find out if something was going on in the dungeon. Now, as for the place that Lily went to, this was a bar meant for a specific group of people. It was the place to go if you wanted to find information brokers or post a quest anonymously. If you were to consider the guild to be the front, then this bar would definitely be its back. Only those who had something to hide from the guild would ever be here. That being the case, the fact that Madel was here looking for the same information that she was posed a very significant threat to the whole operation. You see, Madel wasn't just some typical adventurer. She was a person who specialized in being a rogue-like thief, making her very skilled at sneaking around and gaining information. So this wasn't someone that Lily needed suspecting her. That's why she decided to leave right away. Moving on to the scene with Wine, what the anime didn't show was how her curiosity had been aroused by pretty much everything. She kept pointing things out and asking what they were, making new discoveries with each and every inquiry. One thing that Belle began to notice was just how quick it was that Wine was expanding her vocabulary. She was using far more words than she was yesterday. Perhaps at the time she had limited herself because she was scared. But now she was talking way more fluently. Because of how fast she was picking things up, Belle couldn't quite attribute it to her actually learning. It was almost as if something else was allowing her to pick up and understand these words very quickly, making it yet another mystery to add to this monster. When nighttime came around, it was after dinner and all the fan service parts that we got to see individual moments from everyone else. But before we get to that, there was one very important fact excluded from the bath scenes that needs to be shared. Perhaps even the most important of the episode. Despite what you may have been led to believe, Hestia does not have the biggest chest. And surprisingly neither does Haruhime either. That prestigious title belongs solely to Mikoto. As for why it doesn't seem that way all the time, well, that's because her chest is normally bandaged up. But yeah, that was a fact that for some reason was made very clear in this part of the novel. So I figured you cultured ones would appreciate to know it. In any case, it was in the individual moments after that we got to see more of how everyone else was feeling. Haruhime was sharing with Mikoto why it was she was so fond of Wine. There was something about her that reminded Haruhime of her former self. She reminded her of the person that became alone after having been separated from everyone else when she was younger. This was the person that Haruhime saw whenever she looked at Wine, and it was for that reason that she couldn't abandon her. As for Lily, the essence of what she was saying here was that she was willing to be hated if it meant protecting the Familia. But unlike how Welf said nothing in the anime, he actually told her to go and take a look in the mirror. This was because Lily's face gave off a very visible expression of distress. Welf knew that this wasn't the face of someone whose words were backed by determination. Even so, he still couldn't deny Lily's last words of Wine being a monster. That much was an indisputable fact, and it was more than enough to show that what Lily was saying wasn't entirely wrong. 
Now, the last part regarding Wiene's dream actually left out one of the most important aspects to it. As I'm sure you noticed, these were much more than just dreams. They were more like fragments of memories. The reason I say this is because Wiene began to recall very specific moments regarding different adventurers. She recalled a time when she dreamed of an elf who had shielded her badly injured partner with her own body. There was another time when she'd dream of a dwarf who'd stayed behind to fight a whole passageway of monsters by himself just so he could buy time to allow the rest of his party to escape. It was seeing these people that would cause Wiene to feel cold. But beyond that frigid feeling was one that also saw these people as beautiful. To see others interact in such a loving and supportive manner was something that appealed to her in a way that she simply couldn't understand. So it was after hearing this that Belle couldn't just simply disregard these recollections as dreams. There was now the lingering thought that these could actually be her memories. Anyway, the last scene with Hermes was supposed to give context to what exactly was happening. To clarify on his involvement, his familia was one of the only ones trusted to work alongside the guild. You see, the guild controlled all legal rights to magic stones and pretty much any other products found in the dungeon. That meant monsters as well. So, since there was this underground organization currently smuggling dungeon-related items and monsters to other countries, the guild had decided to put Hermes in charge of investigating it. It's for this reason that his familia can enter and exit Orario without any problems. The guild trusted them enough to get the job done. That said, the report regarding what Laurier had found was a lot more gruesome than what we were told in the anime. According to her, Monsters had been chained to each other in holding cells and repeatedly violated in a way that she couldn't even believe to be possible for humans. Just remembering what it was she saw when she found them was enough to make her sick to her stomach. All the monsters she had found were pretty much already dead. But there was one in particular that stuck in her mind especially well. Not only was this one still alive, but it also begged her to deliver an item to one of its comrades. It wanted Laurier to deliver its scarred and ragged horn. This was nothing more than a typical drop item that you could find anywhere in the dungeon. But to this monster it seemed to be much more significant. So here was this talking monster crying and begging for help. It looked and spoke to Laurier in ways that any other normal person would. And just like how it affected Belle, Laurier was now overwhelmed by a similar sense of confusion. Everything she was led to believe was now flipped on its head. So, the only thing that Hermes said after this was that he'd take care of everything from here. As for what was on the scroll, well, that was a list of all the merchant organizations connected to the smuggling ring, allowing him to trace everything back to Ikelos, which also brings us to the end of episode 1. So, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this new cut content video, and if you did, then feel free to leave a like or comment so that you can help the video to do better. Also, don't forget that this will be a weekly series on Thursdays once I catch up to the anime. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!